Okay guys, welcome to this morning's Fife Property Show. This is episode 100. Richard will be joining us soon. He's just getting everything restarted and all the rest of it. Um, so we're talking today about damage control. Expert tips on how to minimise the wear and tear of your buy-to-let property. Okay, so let's get cracking. I mean, the end of the tenancy is often filled with uncertainty. Landlords worry over the state of the property when it's returned. It's clearly, obviously, a thing that everybody worries about. Well, tenants fret about how much of their security deposit will be refunded. Uh, fortunately, there are many ways that landlords, uh, for landlords to design a, a, a potential for damage to reduce the impact of wear and tear and alleviate the nail biting as the checkout day approaches. Now, clearly at this point in time, what you find when it comes to a tenancy checkout, that the um, tenancy safe deposit scheme. So what happens here is with the safe deposit scheme, it's custodial scheme in Scotland. Um, what happens is the tenancy checkout is all done by a separate entity and a separate board. So we check out, we put our um, uh, system forward. And then also what we do as well is we then put the... <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Richard. How are you? Good morning. But late to the party. What I'm talking about this morning, the 100th show, obviously, um, we're talking about the tenancy checkout. So I'm just getting to the point about yeah. explaining why the, how the custodial scheme works in terms of the tenancy deposit and safe deposit scheme and how um, it's it's protected the deposit of the tenant. And it's up to us to put our case forward for the landlord um, on the yeah. checkout. I mean, most checkouts work OK, don't they? Yeah, I mean, nine times out of ten, they do uh, tend to go without any issues. But... There is that small percentage of tenancies that do have issues at the end and the yeah. importance of the inventory and condition reporting things at that point when you're trying to make a claim against any damages that are made safe deposits uh, scotland who we, we deal with there is other uh, deposit schemes yeah it's really important to have that information and that evidence to be able to justify what you're um making a claim against at the end of the deposit yeah and the tenant puts forward their their um, thought process on you know what the tenancy is like and uh, and also um, what what happens you know for them at the end where they believe their position is because we it's like I remember I remember what I was speaking to somebody who's who is actually a judge and 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 they actually oversee court proceedings and he says what you don't realise Jim that the two people that come the defendant and the other person. Um, I actually both come at the same time and they both believe they have they have the right version of events. And he says, yeah. actually, you've both got the right version of events anyway, in your mind. Um, it's just we have to see it from a different perspective and ascertain which is actually right and which isn't um, from, from the legal point of view. So that's how they look at it. And it's similar to the safe deposit scheme, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's always the case when we get to the end of tenancy that people will have their own uh, version of what they think is acceptable and what they think is right and their own level of what they think is uh, cleanliness and what they think is wear and tear. But it's, it's up to us to provide as much of the evidence and then the adjudication team then make a decision on what actually does yeah. constitute wear and tear or will constitute a damage um, a, a damage claim as, as well. So now we'll go on and talk about wear and tear and stuff like that, and, and setting yeah. up the tenancy progress the process in the beginning. But the most fundamental factors, and um, it really includes, um, is the way the contract and the relationship with your tenants are set up from the start. That's one of the ones that we're going to talk about. Yeah. The livability and durability of your buy to let when your tenants actually move in, uh, and that how your tenants and the property are managed during the tenancy, which is a key here. And yeah. that's why most people use professional letting agents to do that, and professional managing agents um, to do that as well. Ones that have got a track record. You know, I'll be honest and say, Richard, you know yourself, it's easy for somebody to start, to start up as a letting agent and just say, we're letting property, we've been signed off. It's like, but, but being signed off doesn't mean to say you've got a track record and you understand what to do and how to do it and how to, the experience that comes with it in order to do that. So, I mean, a shared goal of every landlord and tenant should be that the home's easy to live in, easy to love, easy to hand back in a good condition. And with that in mind, this is what we're going to talk about. Everything that you need to help your buy to let stay in uh, great shape during the tenancy to minimise the gaps in uh, in your income between the actual property letting. This is this is occupancy, isn't it? Voids. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, and, and 
Yeah, the points that you've raised there, I think, are, are the key factors in having a successful uh, tenancy and functioning buy-to-let property. One of the most important, if not the most, I think, is finding uh, the tenant, the right tenant in the first place. Um, and there's a there's a process that you go through uh, at the beginning to make sure that you've eliminated um, the person that maybe isn't right for that property or that tenancy, and then ultimately yeah. the proper management throughout. Perfect. Okay. Do you want to cover the first thing? I mean, what is the difference between? Yeah, I think. What is the difference between damage and wear and tear? Yeah, that and that is the big discrepancy, especially when it comes to any deposit cl uh, claims and things. And the difference between damage and wear and tear, and what actually is wear and tear. I mean, one of the challenges that um, obviously of letting uh, is that people have that different uh, opinion on what counts as damage and what's classed as wear and tear. And despite the occasional grey area, um, they can be broadly defined. Um, differently. I mean, wear and tear, for instance, is uh, the natural consequences of everyday life. I mean, we see it every day um, and that things that lead to maybe frayed carpets or uh, minor scuffs on the, on the uh, skipping boards or face out, patients of the, the doors, chips and scratches on walls, uh, woodwork and floors, as I've just said, and uh, faded by sunlight and plaster cracks as well. Things like these are all um, wear and tear over a period of time. Um, leaking yeah. uh, paint on exterior woodwork and things as well, like decking and things. These will all, over time, show signs of wear and tear. Um, mm -hmm. Loose handles and locks and things on doors, uh, that's another one. So over a period of time, you need to take into consideration that if these are not properly looked at and maintained, these are classed as wear and tear. Um, yeah. Damage, on the other hand, um, as a result of an accident or a person's negligence, um, whether that be the tenant, a pet, a visitor, um, and that will range from things like we've all seen in the past, Jim, and I, and I have I, I obviously spilt drinks, or I think one of the um, one of the most common ones I've seen that uh, always tries to get covered up is the toppled iron that burns the carpet. Oh, it's amazing! Eh? It's like it's like wait a minute, you, uh, why is that seat in that position when I'm doing my inspection? It's because or it's been moved across. You burnt, you burnt the floor with iron. <laughs> yeah, and and, and I'm, I'm amazed at that because. Um, it's not something that I've ever done, um, but I always wonder how it happens. Do, do people just iron on the floor? <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's probably what it is. Or they put the iron down on the floor rather than the holder or on the ironing board, and it's been knocked over. Yeah. And I've, I've seen it uh, over the years, and it's one thing that they try to hide uh, tenants if they do it because it is obviously genuine mistake. It's not something that's done deliberately, uh, but ultimately it is negligence. It is, does class as a damage, and you will be charged for it. Um, Another one as well for me is, um, you know, the worktops in the kitchens. I mean, yeah. everybody everybody thinks that they're indestructible, but the reality is if you take a, a really hot pan off the worktop, and we've fallen foul of this actually, and put it on the worktop, uh, on the, off the cooker and put it on the worktop, it will bubble, it will yeah. burst, um, so you will get a sort of blister on it. Uh, and that's the worktop ruined, and it costs a fortune to replace worktops because the disruption it involves, especially if you've got integrated You've got your sink integrated, you've got your um, um, probably your hob integrated, um, you've maybe got something else integrated, possibly in the worktop. Um, so that really does cause a big, big problem. Um, another one is, well, is, you know, everybody, I know we talked about frayed carpets as being normal wear and tear, but frayed carpets when your cat's scratching at the corner of the room to get out the door isn't wear and tear. No. It's actually damage, isn't it? Yeah, it's damage. I mean, I, I mentioned pets there and uh, pet damage is uh, a big thing and a lot of, thing that land, lot of things that landlords don't uh, really look forward to dealing with because it can be that can be quite extensive if a pet's been left to mm -hmm. just obviously free reign in the property. A pet needs to be looked after properly. If it needs let out, it needs to be let out. If it's if it's a house animal, then it needs to have the proper facilities for the toilet and maybe a scratching pole if it's a cart and things. If you've not done any of that and took these measures, then again, it's classed as the negligence and damage, and you will be charged for it. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear anybody's comments out there about what you feel is wear and tear and what you feel is damage in yeah. a property. Uh, from from a landlord and a tenant's point of view, it'd be interesting to see that in the comments if anybody's got anything to say on that. Um, uh, the other ones as well is probably, you know, things like uh, ripped curtains, blinds. Blinds yeah. damaged as well. I mean, vertical blinds cost an absolute fortune. And yeah. some people put them in, and then, you know, the best one in the world is another classic as well, is the cats because we have the same thing as well they get in between mm -hmm. the blinds and they start to shed hair onto the blinds so by the time the tenant's moving out 
they're, they are really in a bit of disrepair. So can that be considered wear and tear or is that actual damage as a result of it? Um, I, I would I would probably err on the side of damage. Yeah, and so I would agree. Um, and But then obviously some people might not see that and that's where the discrepancy comes in. And yeah, and that's, where the, that's where the, that's where the, uh, that's where the uh, first two tribunal actually adjudicates on that and says if it is or not. Now, the one key factor out of this as well is how long has the tenant stayed in the property? Because, for example, if your carpet, say it's frayed at the corner all the time, and it maybe is the pet that's doing it, but if your tenant's been in the property for five years, the, the, you'll probably find that the, the tribunal will actually look at that and think, well, they've stayed in it for five years. The, five, the carpet's five years old. And, and really, in and, and, and essence, I, I, you know, they look at in the view that a carpet should only last about five years anyway. Yeah. So they would probably end up putting that as wear and tear, wouldn't they, rather than damage? Yeah, they're quite they're quite possibly so. And also, one a good a good one to bear in mind with carpets as well is people think if there's damage to a carpet, then it will be completely well the monetary value will be rewarded to completely replace it, and it's not. It's yep. only a, a percentage amount. It kind of it kind of reminds me of the hire cars when you go over and get a hire car. I remember I was getting nailed for maybe a scratch on a door. Now it wasn't me. It was actually when I took it out. So they managed to get the they managed to um, waylay me. And Lucky I had insurance. I was able to claim it back. But they didn't actually say about doing the whole door again. They just said, look, it's 50 euros off for that scratch yeah. because that's the normal price. And uh, and then what happens is they leave the scratch there. Somebody else hires it and hires it. And eventually, at some point in time, they either sell the car on or they actually um, get the door redone um, and actually finished off again, which everybody else has contributed to, probably with that same scratch. <laughs> <laughs> More than likely, eh? <laughs> they probably they probably nail everybody for that same scratch. I uh, wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, right. yeah I think so. so well, that, say, that yeah. then comes back to then that then comes back to saying what you said about the importance of having a, a proper inventory done in the beginning, and not yeah. just a not just a oh that's there and that's there. We're talking about a proper condition report, not an inventory, but a condition report. And so, what is a condition report to someone out there? What what is what is that, Richard? Yeah, I mean, condition reports are not mandatory. You don't need to do it as part of legislation, but for a safeguard to yourself and your property, I would always recommend having one. They are a very comprehensive, um, they're a comprehensive record of what the property is like at the beginning of the tenancy. And this will mm -hmm. consist of uh, descriptions of each room, all the fixtures, the fittings in that room, um, and they will also have photos to accompany that. Now, it's very important that, um, you realise that the the wording and the terminology to describe things is done properly as well, whether it's new or whether it's um, a certain uh, of a certain age. Um, you know, there, there's certain words and things that will um, help that along. Because if things are just, if you just kind of do, you could do your own inventory, which I wouldn't recommend, because you could yeah. use terminology and words for things that really don't describe its actual condition, and that will be brought into question when they do the um, deposit claim. And we know that because we've had it, haven't we? So yes. it's experience and expertise and knowledge that passes on in, 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 in terms of what people can and what people can't do. So we understand that. And uh, and that's really why people buy into our services for that yeah. for that specific reason. Uh, one of the ones, interesting ones is me, is the, is the dogs. Dogs that scratch yeah. at the door all the time. Yeah. So eventually over a period of time, people don't notice it. But when you've seen the door originally brand new, and then by the time you get the property back and the, the, all the scratches are in the door itself, cats as well in the corners of uh, of wallpaper in the corners sometimes so it's better actually to get scratch posts up for cars uh, for cats sorry and uh, possibly to let the dogs out the back garden um maybe another one as well is back garden burnt grass yeah with the dogs doing the toilet mm -hmm. you know i've seen that i've been around to properties actually for sale not for rent and they've actually gone out the bat and says, well, you know, this is because of this because of the dog. <laughs> yeah. And it's understandable. And it says it's no big deal. You know, people will understand that. It's easy to put uh, grass down. But that can happen, isn't it? When you give someone a perfect a perfect garden when you hand it over to them, and then all of a sudden you get a garden back, which is like the house of horrors. Yeah, gardens are a, a really important one as well. And something that uh, I mean, tenants sometimes concentrate on the house and how that's handed back but you need to think about the garden and grounds as well um, and yeah. we've been handed back uh, in the past properties that are fine and then we go outside and we're like but well, it's all weedy here and it's like you say there's grass maybe burnt with the pet here and, and gardening to rectify is quite a costly thing so you need to keep that in mind as well that's no cheap 
It's no cheap. I think everybody just thinks they can do it themselves or they can just get somebody around for five pounds an hour. Um, but the reality is to get a proper professional gardener around, you're talking about maybe 30 quid an hour or possibly even more because they've got all their tours and equipment to pay for as well as the people that work with them. Um, I think as well as to do. If there's fences and uh, decking areas and things that are timber decking areas in, in particular, if they yeah. are provided as part of the tenancy, if over a period of time, if these need maintained and painted and things, you need to go back to your landlord or your agent and say, look, obviously, this is, well, I've been in here X amount of the time, this has now been faded by the sun and things. And then the landlord will say, right, okay, well, let's look to get that sorted. You just leave that and don't report it. And then we come two, three years down the line and it's all uh, faded by the sun and, and, and obviously not in good condition, then is that wear and tear or is that negligence? I would say that's negligence because you're Yeah, not it's, board, it's bordering on negligence, isn't it? It's yeah. like, for example, um, you know, way in the past when I very first started out, there was no sort of system incorporated. And that was 30 years ago. I remember I'd go to people's houses just to sort something out. And then the next thing they would have a list of everything it was then done and then i would point up and say look you know when when did that happen then and it was like well it happened about nine months ago so why did you not tell me at the time yeah because i could have got it at that time and it would have been it wouldn't have been as bad so to me that's kind of negligence in terms of the in terms of how we're looking at it because they've just failed to report it and they've not even bothered about it so from a tenant's point of view you need to make sure you report everything just so it doesn't come back to you because once you've reported it, it's handed to someone else, um, the landlord or the managing agent, yeah. and it's their responsibility now. And because you've reported it and you've got a record of you reporting it, maybe by email and a follow-up email or a text or something like that, at least now the liability is off of you and it's on to the landlord and the managing agent to sort that out. Absolutely. So that's one of the top tips, I would say, for tenants. So yeah. how do we set up this tenancy process then for success? You know, how, how would we go about that? I mean, how would you go about that? I mean, every landlord wants their buy to let to be well cared for by their tenants. Uh, never underestimating the influence that it can you, you can have. And so much comes down to actually starting this off on the right foot, beginning with the initial viewing. Um, yeah. So what measures can we take, Richard, to make yeah, sure um, make sure that, that goes right? As you say about the initial viewing, it takes us right back to, obviously, setting up the tenancy and finding the right person i think is so important um, and i think when you meet potential tenants uh, at the viewing or whether it's just leading up to the viewing it's about talking to the people about their lives and their current home um, and where they are with a uh, uh, with that at the moment and then the viewings uh, at the viewings when you speak to them to ensure that you've got the best match for the property that yeah, you're this, is a, this is a key one where i've found out in the past where people actually talk a good game and then yeah you know you know what's coming next there it's like i'm in the neighborhood can i pop in and just have a chat with you for a while about your about your prospective tenancy the next minute it's an ideal opportunity to look around their house and see how they actually live yeah and then that's where that's where you get a good match for your property because there's been some times that people have actually talked an extremely good game i've done the doorstep thinking i just need a wee bit more follow-up information from this person just to make sure that they actually stay in the place they're staying i've gone round in their yard or their garden is like a mechanic's workshop with yeah, different true. various cars lying about rusting away and then i've gone into the house and it's like oh my god it's like the whole place and you can see what they've been doing constantly is maybe drying all their clothes in the house therefore all the damp and the condensations going to the walls and the ceilings and everywhere else and behind the beds and the the cabinets and everything and then they're going oh it's uh, my landlord is not going to fix this it's rising damp and it's like no it's no it's because you're not even ventilating the property properly and i'm thinking you've got no chance um now i've not said that to them i just walked away quietly and says look unfortunately you're unsuccessful for the tenancy at this point in time you know because the landlord's chosen someone else uh, and and left it at that so you know if you're a tenant out there that's a top tip on make sure that you don't make sure you don't fall foul of this and make sure you keep everything in good order because if you do want another property and your landlord or managing agent or them uh, does actually do a check on you you're not going to get another property no matter how much you try um because of that so they will ask questions of you another classic as well is the rent up to date that's another one isn't it is the rent up to date and also is the property in a good condition and does the tenant have any antisocial behavior um, yeah. and that's another one um to do um so what other ones do we have yeah um i think as well as well as doing that and just to, to, to obviously double back a wee bit jim back in the beginning for me that's something that you taught me about nip around and see them see what they live and things and i'm like i can't do that <laughs> 
Well, but, it gives, um, it gives, I'll tell you what it does do. It looks for a responsible character, and part of which is a, a gut feeling. that We've got yeah. it, we've been doing it for years, isn't it? Yeah. This then comes down to the experience. Yeah, meeting someone and getting that feel for their character and who they actually are as a person and having that feeling yourself, I think, goes hand in hand with all the other parts of the, the whole process of selecting yeah. somebody who's suitable, um, as well as, obviously, the proper vetting procedure, and that obviously includes all the credit checks, uh, references from previous landlords, as you say, to see whether they actually are as good as tenant as they are claiming to be. Like obviously, their their rents up to date. They don't have any antisocial. Um, also, their employers as well, um, validating that they actually do have the employment that they're stating that they have. They've got the income coming in that they're stating that they have. Um, and if they've got guarantors and things, um, then you could also uh, speak to them and make sure that they back up what the tenant uh, is provided or the potential tenant information that they're providing you is, is accurate. Um, mm -hmm. and I think nowadays as well, as we as we do more of what we're doing right now is obviously video and um, obviously Zoom calls and things. You could do a lot of virtual one-to-ones um, -one with garden tours and things. I would always recommend meeting potential tenants in per person. But if they've got somebody signing along with them and maybe they don't live local or things, do a video call with them, get to know somebody um, or get feedback on the person uh, that way as well. That's quite a good way to do yeah. things. See the proper vetting and credit checks and all the rest of it. I mean, everybody says to do that, but you can do it in different ways, can't you? Um, yeah. Also, I think as well, even getting a guarantor with somebody that's even past the credit check is a really good one to do as well, because you've yeah. always got a secondary aspect and it's like a belts and braces approach to it. Um, what I've found as well in the past, um, and I've been a bit sceptical about it, is when you go to the previous landlord or the previous letting agent or anything like that, and you do kind of get a good reference, you want to make sure that you can trust that person, if that makes sense. Yeah. Often I've had, well, when I started it in the early days and I did it all myself, often I've had in the past where I've gone to a landlord and I'm kind of thinking, and I've now assessed that you're actually giving them a good reference because you're wanting rid of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and no, that's true. I've had that, yeah. And it's, and it's making sure you catch that out as well and understand that that's where they're coming from because they can't get rid of them. So they're actually trying to offset that onto you by saying if they move to this property, thank God I'll get rid of them. Um, yeah. So I've actually been, I've actually, I don't think I've ever fallen foul of it, but I've actually caught it in in, in the process of of the vetting process in terms of what I'm doing. Um, the great thing about you know guarantors as well is guarantors are cast out and they're usually in a position uh, you've always got somebody to go to to put some leverage on on the person if they're not um, if they're not uh, uh, adhering to the tenancy and they're adhering to any of the tenancy terms because the guarantor is obviously the last person that wants to know that they're obviously going to have to foot the bill for rent. Or, yeah. or or any damage to the property. So, you know, it's a really good indication as well if no one's prepared to be a guarantor for you, even your mum and dad. I've had that in the past where their mum and dad suddenly, yeah. like, there's no way I'm going to be a, a guarantor for him or her. And I'm like, really? That speaks volumes for me. Even if this person credit checks up and their mother and father is not prepared to be a guarantor for them, it, it rings alarm bells straight away, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to look out for and red flags that will um, give you an indication whether you're on the right track with the right person or not before yeah. you even enter into any kind of contract or uh, agreement. Um, and that's other things as well. Obviously, we spoke about inventories are really important to have at yeah. the start as well. Um, making sure you prepare the proper tenancy agreement. Now, obviously, we all know or we all should know that the private residential tenancy is the template that the Scottish government rolled out. Uh, in Scotland and uh, at the end of 2017 and that's what we all work from unless there's tenancies running from but before you that. You can still put certain conditions yeah. and criteria and over and above that in order to safeguard your position yeah. if it comes to a civil liability in a civil case, can't you? Yeah, I mean there's the basis of the tenancy agreement that you need to, new, need to use but you could also make additions to that and, and we have our own version which has got um, clauses and things and, and additional extras that we've put in. I've been really surprised recently. Uh, I've had the opportunity to look at the versions that other agents or landlords have been using. I am baffled by it, but anyway, um, you would be surprised. I, I, um, nothing surprises me because there's yeah. people that come up with just, I've got an A4 bit of paper and I've just written down, yeah. you're this and you're that. I've even got a, a position to where in the past, um, um, some people I knew were really good at what they did and they've been in this business for a long time. They've actually got no tenancy in place at all, no tenancy agreement. They're just like, oh, I just I just moved them in and that's it. And it's like, okay, so 
Um, this is another insight where you get to look around somebody's property and um, when you're actually around and you do a doorstep and it's like you see if they're actually doing all the current legislation requirements. Yeah. You, you know, the electricity fuse box, you know, the compliance with the wow. EICR, also yeah. also things like the EPC, also things like Legionella testing, also things like the heat and smoke detectors. It's amazing how many different ones. Uh, and I'll just say on record, even the council included break the law. Yeah, I've been round at many a council house and they've only got the old legislation for requirement for heat and smoke detectors in their properties. And they're the ones to castigate private landlords, believe it or not. And they're just as culpable in terms of what they're doing, if not worse. Yeah, I mean, and you know yourself, Jim, with uh, obviously a lot of um, EICRs for us are getting uh, renewed at the moment because we're just past that five year point uh, and a lot of your own ones are getting done. And you know yourself, the cost involved to get it up to um, the uh, current legislation at the moment yeah. because there's been so many changes uh, in the last five years even just to the electrical side of things and um, it's kind of um, it's kind of for some landlords they don't realize they've not put money aside and it's kind of a ticking time bomb to say to say as such because you could be talking about two two and a half thousand pounds just to get the new eicr because you're having to do a full rewire because there's a bit the guidance has actually improved and 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 there's there's a higher standard now um, from what it was five years ago isn't it yeah oh yeah i mean it really is and i think if you're a, a reputable agent or landlord and really follow the rules and the legislation like obviously myself when i come up against when I, things that i think is just crazy because it's not how i would operate um it is how some people do it and it's really uh, that's what the legislation's there for it's to weed out these people that really just don't pay attention and, and yeah. aren't interested in doing things properly um so although there may be a lot out there that uh, is there for a reason um and it's easy enough to follow it um quite closely because obviously well we do um, now, we, uh, now we have talked about things like the tenancy agreement like that, but it is important to get everybody to sign that's actually going to be involved in the tenancy agreement isn't it because then it's not a legislative document if that's the case it's i would say it's imperative <laughs> that that is done properly at the beginning and yeah. any tenancy that's set up without an agreement um, and everyone signing it on that day at least um or, or prior um it's just to me that's alien because i've never ever done it like that but I, I do see it happen, um, yeah. but you leave yourself wide open to uh, just a raft of things to go wrong, um, and it could leave you in a, in a position where you're going to have somebody in your property where you cannot obviously retain possession yeah. for a long time. They'll have a, they'll have a secure tenancy agreement. Yes. Yeah. Under the and legislation, that's... by default. And um, the other thing about it as well, we talked about security deposits, safe deposits, Scotland. And, yeah. and make sure it's in the proof scheme. But there is a time frame, isn't it, to make sure it's actually the, the, the deposit is actually lodged. I'm still days. amazed at how many landlords are actually holding deposits in their own bank accounts. And it's like, that's you're, that's illegal. You're not meant to be doing that anymore. You're meant to lodge every single tenant deposit with a safe, with a custodial scheme, which is three of them in Scotland, um, a government approved custodial scheme. And if you don't do that, you can be liable to a fine up to Three times the rent? Three times the, the, the monthly rent, yeah. And you, you get 90 days to bank your deposit. I, if, I, and it is surprising how many landlords don't use a deposit scheme still I, or aren't aware that the deposit scheme is something that they need to use. I met a landlord the other day that has been self-managing for a while. She's enlisted um, my help, but she wasn't aware. She was just putting it in her own bank. Now, granted, she was she's returned her the last deposit and to the tenant and things, and there hasn't been any issues, but... She left herself wide open and she wasn't aware. Yeah. So t um, tell me this then, if that's the case then, what is landlord registration doing? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. They so how, really are these, how are these how these how are they policing and catching these people? They're not. They're and not. and that's the reality. So all the people that have gone round, all the landlords that are compliant with the legislation, it's the majority of us, by the way. It's well over 99% of landlords are compliant with everything, and then they do a good job. Yeah. But there is landlords out there that just don't bother at all, but they don't get any repercussions because no one's policing it. No one's prepared to do anything about them. And when they can do something about them, guess what? The legislation is completely toothless. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I do... There are certain landlords and things out there that um, don't maybe realise that they're doing something wrong because they're uneducated to the fact um which is when then you should really enlist an agent who obviously is, is keeping up to date with the legislation and it's their job to make sure that it is done and everything's kept in compliance with the, yeah. the current legislation so if there's one important thing in that in some measure what is the final measure you think that people should take 
um, to make sure that the tenancy set up correctly. Yeah, I think once we, in that whole tenancy set up process, you need to be able to provide the tenant with the correct information when they move into the property. Yeah, we do. I mean, a complete move in park, which can, contains contact numbers for who they should contact for emergencies or to report anything that they think when something starts to begin, like we spoke about, obviously reporting maintenance issues. If you've got a, an agent that they should be um, providing them with the number for our hours, if it's an emergency, a number for general repairs, mm. if it's through obviously working hours, the the correct place to pay their rent to, and also copies of all the current certificates and things, and have all that together along with the correct uh, tenancy agreement signed by everyone. Uh, it's so important that they have all that information at the beginning and they know exactly what to do in the instance of uh, a repair or reporting any damage or an emergency if, it, if that was to happen also. Yeah, this is quite an interesting one when I, when I think about it, just to finalise and finish off that subject um, on, on this part. Um, successful tenancies actually come from a combination of protecting your property and selecting the perfect people to live in it. Definitely. Now, there's a double-edged sword there because if you protect the person's, the landlord's property and select the right person to live in there, some landlords actually turn around and go, well, it's an easy gig for you. I may as well take it back and manage it myself. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so we're not going to go our way to get the worst tenant in order for us to manage it. We want to make it as easy as for us as possible. But the whole point is, I always look at it like this, as your management fee goes every month on, on, on more, almost like an insurance policy where you've got somebody sitting there um, it, it, able to react quickly or be proactive in their approach to managing your tenancy to enable the property to be protected and the tenant to be perfect to live in it. That's yeah. the whole point. That's what you. That's why you pay that management fee. I would say. Um, so if anything does go wrong, it's the vast majority of management fees that everybody's paying. It pays for the thing that might go wrong, and that's yeah. kind of how insurance works, isn't it? Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. And and over the years, I have had um, a few landlords come to me and say, oh, things are going brilliant, the tenant's amazing. And it's like, well, I know, I put them in there. <laughs> uh, and, they, and they want to take it back and and uh, and look after it themselves because they think, well, it's an easy gig, like you say. But it's only an easy gig or seems like an easy gig because we've done the job right in the first place. Um, yeah. And you and, continue to do the job right when the tenant is in there, and that's why yeah. it's going smoothly, because you keep on, uh, for want of a better phrase, on top of the tenant um, uh, to make sure they're obviously looking after the property and make sure they looked after as well. Uh, yeah. And, you know, this is a this is a, this is is a a win-win situation for both parties. This is the manager agent makes sure the tenant's looked after, the tenant makes sure the property's looked after, and the rent's paid on time, and then they're not, they're not an antisocial. And it's, it, works, it works in that combination of events. So you sometimes get as well as... Some tenants it will be antisocial, and this is this is just a generalisation. But I think it's more or less true out of the experience I've had over the last thirty years. Uh, a lot of tenants that aren't that good will not go for a managed property with a letting agent. Yeah, they'll steer clear of an agent because they know that this agent will be able to pick up on maybe red flags that they know that they've got and they're, they're keeping aside. Uh, and and a general a, a, the the general landlord on their own might not pick up on that, whereas agencies like ourselves, obviously go through a, a much more rigorous pro, uh, process. And it now, does pick up on. Let me say as well, it equally works on the other side as well, as most, as uh, the landlords that are in, uh, not that good, you know, in other words, the rogue landlords that they call them, these yeah. landlords actually don't don't come to letting agents do that no. um, for, the, for the same purpose. And sometimes what you get then is, the two of them meeting together, the tenant's not really that good a tenant, the landlord is not really that good a landlord, and that's a recipe for disaster. A recipe for disaster, definitely. Yeah, well, landlord. That's where, I think, that's where I think legislation should actually be. Be. I mean, it's great having legislation, but I think they have to apply it and they have to they have to police it and make sure it's actually instigated properly and implemented it properly as well. Properly as well. If you don't have that, then what's the point of putting it in? It's just. It's just. It's just. It's just you know um voice and your your for your own concern that's it that's really what it comes down to it's just, yeah. it's just words yeah legislation is good uh, but i think like you say although it's rolled out to everybody i think it does need to be concentrated and and enforced a lot more in the right situation and in, in yeah. certain situations like what we're we're talking about there uh, that there is landlords that will avoid letting agents because we won't let a property unless you have a landlord registration number. We won't list a property without an EPC. Do you know what I mean? There's all these kind of things that we won't do because obviously that's legislation. 
Um, and there's been a, there's been a few times in the past where we've actually given the landlord back their property because yeah. we don't feel they're, they're they're allowing us to run it properly. And what I mean is, like, when they we're needing repairs done or we're needing improvements done, they've gone, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And it's like we felt that that was absolutely necessary for the tenant under mm -hmm. the Standard Repairing Act and said, look, you know, if that's the case, then have your property back. We're not yeah. managing it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as we talk about um, repairs and things uh, that are needed in a property and what's what's necessary and maybe what's not, yeah. um, you can look at, designing out a uh, the design out damage at, at properties um, and making your rental property more yeah. durable uh, and this will help shrug off the uh, rigors of daily life uh, meaning like less work that you're having to put in to replace worn out fixtures and fittings and and how the buy to let stands up against um this yeah. this ultimately comes down to um paying for quality yes um, more than anything there's the classic example about things like um the wearability and durability of maybe cars or clothes or anything like that it's like you get what you pay for so if, you know if you're going to pay as cheap as possible for something and try and find something as cheap as possible you probably find the products as cheap as possible as well and the durability isn't going to be that great i mean it's about using good quality stuff um, in the beginning here's a classic example i used to go down and buy the cheapest paint at b and q or, or focus at that 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 shows yeah, you yeah, age. Okay, focus <laughs> focus <laughs> diy i used to go down and buy the cheapest paint at focus diy right but what you found was that the paint wasn't really that good and you had to do about seven coats to actually get it to cover up you know and, and actually be really good whereas if you went and bought and and, and when you think about the labor it's wasted in that because the labor is the highest content and the highest price in terms of what you're doing it's your time is more important than anything and then you would buy dulux which has got a a higher opacity and what opacity is it means if you've got writing like this and you put something another page in front of it if the writing doesn't show through it means it's got a higher a higher opacity if yep. the writing does show through the, the page it means it's got a lower opacity and um, it's kind of like your frosted windows in your house mm -hmm. so that's kind of what it is so it's a false economy actually to go and get the cheap paint because the 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 I, I didn't want to say expensive the better quality people i think, I think you it more for it, but it's better it's, it's a better product isn't it it saves you time yeah i always encourage the uh, landlords and and things that um, a mid-range product whether it be paint or whether it be an appliance or whether it be a fixture um i don't always think that um going for the most expensive and overspending i mean it's, it's not the way to go um but like you say using cheaper versions of things they won't stand the test of time but you get really good mid-range products um, that are obviously, again, mid-range price-wise yeah. as well, uh, that will stand the test of time. One of the ones I do see, which is a classic, is how many people put um, mat emulsion paint on their bathroom ceiling. Yeah. And it's like, it should be vinyl silk straight away because it's washable. And you're going to, if you put matte emulsion, all you do is the water vapor thing is in, it soaks in, and then you eventually get damp in there. You know, all the wee spores coming up is black. So it's not rising damp or anything like that. It's just pure condensation, but it's yeah. also poor quality um, and finish in the first place. So always when, when you're doing ceilings and kitchens and bathrooms where, where vapor and water and condensation is about, always make sure to use vinyl silk. And same with curtains and facings and that as well. So they're all wipeable and they can be wiped down. So you don't have that that constant hunt to repaint all the time. I mean, loose handles, big thing, eh? Loose handles yeah. every single time, hinges, hooks, locks, leaky taps, classic example as well, shower fittings. A lot of these things are just left, and then over time they become the, you know, the, the and especially ill fitting doors, they become a real problematic issue and they end up costing you more money because then uh, somebody professional has to be sent out actually to do it. But in actual fact, uh, maybe a handyman at a cheaper rate can actually just sort that in a, in a heartbeat. Uh, and that's it sorted for a minimal cost. Whereas, you know, I've seen occasions where the doors actually over time has been used consistently and it's been ill-fitting and they've ended up having to re replace the door or the mechanism on the lock. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, loose handles and, and, and dodgy locks and handles on kitchen cupboards and things, make yeah. sure they're all secure and functioning properly. These kitchen are cupboards are classic example as well, isn't yeah. it? But yeah. the hinges are actually dropped down a wee bit and the door uh, scrapes against the other door. And then over a period of time, the tenant doesn't bother, but over a period of time, you get a wee, you get a wear. And then the next minute when you put it back, the, 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 the kitchen's damaged. Yeah, and it never, it never lines up properly again. Yeah. Um, 
And the only way uh, to fix that is to replace it, which it could carpets. have been remedied. Carpets for me is another one. Avoid the budget carpets. Go yeah. for mid-range, like you said. You know, the, the I mean, budget carpets wear it really fast. You see them straight away. If you've got uneven floorboards, you get marks in it and lines in it straight away. Um, and often, if they're not fitted properly, you'll get, over a period of time, you'll get the stretch marks shown. So the, you'll get ruffles in the carpets all the way through. We walked into a house the other day, and that's clearly what had happened to the carpet. The, the, the owner, when I was looking, when I was taking the person around the view, um, actually said, oh, well, that's maybe just a stretched carpet and stuff like that. But the problem was um, the actual person viewing um, thought there was something wrong with the floorboards. When in actual fact it wasn't, it was just the carpet was needing stretched again. Yeah, I'll put yeah. carpets and, and, and the uh, the budget versions do not last long. We're not saying go out and, and spend a fortune on really deep pile, expensive carpets, but you do get mid-range, durable carpets. We generally use them ourselves yeah. uh, when we're doing refurbs and things. And and they stand the test of time and they're designed to do that. And they're not overly expensive, but they're not obviously the cheapest range. So either. kitchens and bathrooms, shower rooms, uh, probably tile as well, possibly put vinyl in. I would recommend straight away putting a, a beading all the way around to seal it off so water can't get yeah. underneath it. If that's the case, it's easy to do and just get a bit, you know, silicone all the way around there. So because it, it is classic for people getting out the bath or getting out the mm -hmm. shower or they're cleaning round and they'll drop water onto the onto the vinyl or and then it'll go right under. And then what happens is the, the floor starts to rot. This, if you've got chipboard floor, exactly, you know, some some of the older properties have the chipboard floor. It gets all all, all blown up and and buckled and beveled and. And, and it really it really is problematic, isn't it? So that's one top tip for that. Um, we've, we've talked about timber worktops as well. That's another one, timber worktops. Make, make sure they're sealed properly. The amount of people actually put a plant pot on something and even the, even your windowsill and stuff like that, and then you've got a big mark left where it was before where the water has seeped in over time. Yeah, like we spoke about the pots and things on the uh, worktops, but um, the the reason that pots and things melt the worktops is because they're, lamin they're, they're laminate tops. Um, so you need to be careful that obviously that is uh, going to be yeah. protected and things as well. Mm -hmm. Invest in mid-range appliances. Um, well, I'll, I'll technically, I'll, for the appliances for me, the ones I'll fit in a kitchen is if they're integrated already. So oven hob extractor, I do yeah. go for a mid-range. I don't go for bargain basement. Um, if I do have to put a washing machine in, yeah. I mean, washing machines, to be honest, are really good anyway. You find that they're, they're mostly weighed by Whirlpool. Who has every single brand? It's kind of like it's kind of like Volkswagen do Audi, Skoda, and another another car as well. They're Volkswagen cars, and it's yeah. all the same engine in it. So you kind of think to yourself, well, washing machines and that should be easy. French freezer are easy to accommodate as well. Um, I I don't technically I don't go for integrated appliances for washing machines, fridge freezers because they do cost a lot of money for integration. Um, whereas oven hob extractors are really good mid range and cheap as well. Uh, and easy to, easy to replace, easy lasting, and a pretty standard in terms of size. It, what yeah. you don't get caught out with, unstandard, usually your units are 600 in terms of the length, so 60 yeah. centimetres across, 60 centimetres deep for an oven unit itself and, and when you put a kitchen in, and then you're easy to fit something in right at the back of that. Sometimes uh, a lot of people actually got kitchens and it had the knobs built into the, the, the framework and everything, and it's like, you've got no chance of getting a replacement yeah. kitchen or a replacement unit for that. And um, so that's one of my top tips in there. So remember, buying cheap generally means buying at least twice. I would say that. And anything where there's a, a, a knack for using it is a problem um, um, waiting to happen. Whether Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. So yeah. this is another one that gets me as uh, holes, drilling holes and walls. Holes right. and walls and, and tenants, that, but... drilling holes and things. I mean, Every tenant has obviously uh, things like art and photos and everyday essential things that they hang up. And in between tenancies, they will look um, to put things up where they can hang uh, things on the wall. And uh, they like to add their own personality to their home and it helps them. Yes, I mean, you, do, you want to make them feel settled, don't you? Yeah. You want to make them, I mean, we give them a house and they make it a home. That's really what you want. Yeah. That's an ideal situation. And you, you have to accept that that's going to happen. If they're going to stay there long term, well, that doesn't really matter. But it has to be pointed out in the beginning, doesn't it? That if you're going to do things like that, you'll have to rectify it at the end to make sure it's back to what it was on the condition report. Hence the reason why the importance of a condition report. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, to, to allow someone to make themselves a home, they will need to probably drill holes or 
uh, sometimes uh, make um, brackets, uh, things on walls, and, and make the place their own. Uh, and sometimes people do it a lot more successfully than others. Um, and holes at the end of tenancies and walls and things will need filled, uh, meaning that new ones will then, then be need to be drilled again for the next tenant. So there's a lot of wear and tear there uh, on walls yeah. if you're fill, continually filling and uh, then re-drilling holes and things. But you can take, there's measures you could take to make sure that there's hooks and uh, hanging facilities in certain areas of the, the property where you think that they're going to need to do things like, I mean, jackets and coats and bags and things at the front door. You could have a, you could install maybe hooks and things at the front door where they can hang their coats and bags and things as they come in. Yeah. And that will always be there. And there's no need to continually drill and fill and re and re, re drill for them to put their own uh, coat hooks and things up. Um, maybe put hooks in areas where you think they were going to put a, a mirror or pictures in certain areas of maybe the bedroom or the, or the lounge yeah. um, and the kitchen if there's places where you think, right, this is where they're, this is where, predominantly where they would hang tea towels or aprons or things, put hooks there as well. Um, and then again in the bathroom, maybe on the back of the door or uh, on a certain area of the wall where you think towels could hang here or their bathrobe or things could, could hang there as well. And look for these areas and put the facilities in place for hanging things up and then it might reduce that. Yeah. Uh, I just said quite wall. a good point about the television, eh? about the bracket on the wall. Yeah, that's a big one. It's amazing how many it's amazing how many people do come in and they put a big massive television on the wall, they put the bracket on the wall, and when they leave, they actually decide to take the whole lot with them and think that's okay to leave all that disruption. Yeah. Yeah, and it's one of the main questions you get um, when you do viewings at a property now is can I put the TV on the wall? Um because that's predominantly where a lot of people have their TV now is on the wall. Um yeah. I've seen landlords um leave a bracket in place. Um because obviously, like we just say, it minimises the tenant having to make damage and things. Obviously, that might vary with the size of tele, uh, tele that goes on the wall and things. But uh, it's, if you think that um, it's something you want to do and minimise the tenant making damage to the wall, put a TV bracket up in the position where the TV is supposed to go. Yeah. So that small cost really can add um, an extra touch of, of style and yeah. livability within the buy-to-let property while reducing the potential for damages and making repairs. Eh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that little the impl um, implicating that little at the beginning um, can really save you a lot um, at the end of the tenancy because there's not going to be that extra damage or potential damage caused by tenants trying to put things on the wall. Yeah. So we're talking about the end of the tenancy in that, but we've mm -hmm. never really covered the things like managing the sense in between. I mean, forgive me for saying this, but the most effective way to manage your rental property is to have a managing agent handle everything for you it's key here especially when you're working full time at another job or you don't know anything about the legislation about what to do if anything when people move in when they move out when the during the tenancy as well there's over 70 pieces of legislation you're having to contend with and you have no idea but the rent scotland act is a big big huge issue and you've also got the anti-social behavior act which actually incorporates landlord registration you've got the tenants you've got the the, the tenants repairing act is it um and and in terms Standard of that well. yeah so you've got a whole lot of different things so we can call on a and, and and as well i think the benefit of that is having a managing agent as well it's been around for a long time can call on a trusted bank of contractors uh, at any moment uh, uh, and uh, and they can deal with almost every problem you can imagine and and they know that i mean they know the wall like the inside out don't they I mean, God forbid, I've read the, I remember reading the, the Housing Benefit and General Regulations uh, Act. Um, the Child Poverty Action Group had actually produced it in a book, and it must have been about a thousand pages. But I tell you what, uh, you know, studying that manual was was the be all and end all, and it, and it helped me through a raft of problems I had with the government and with the council in terms of processing applications for housing benefit at that time. Now, housing benefit is now universal credit mm -hmm. in terms of what they will give you towards the costs of uh, of supporting your uh, rental accommodation for people on universal credit but i remember reading that in the early days and and again that's what people are buying into from an experienced letting agent if they have all that knowledge and that experience and that expertise and again we're coming back to saying this about this insurance thing about the fact if anything does go wrong you know you've got the right people on your side yeah i think um people may think that obviously we are obviously promoting this as the best way because obviously we're letting agents as well, but it's not really. And I mean, if you're unsure about the work that goes in to managing a buy-to-let or you're thinking of handling things yourself, 
there is a lot of um, aspects that we cover that are tried and tested formulas yeah. that we use um, and precautions to make well, sure. What, what would that be then? I mean, what would that be? The tried and tested things that you know uh, that works. Yeah. I think, firstly, to be out of management uh, of a property, inspections are so important. Um, we have seen how important they are through lockdown and things where restrictions were put in and we were restricted entry into properties. Well, that wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy, and it was it was it was hard to it was hard to I'll say a challenge. In fact, I'll not say it was hard. I'll say it was a challenge because obviously one of the most important things is to get in there and build you, that you, relationship. Just to, uh, by the way, do you remember that you the other uh, maybe about a month ago you told me there was you were getting castigated for for not doing inspections. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, yeah. Then, and then then you said to the landlord, but we're actually we were on lockdown at that time. We actually yeah. couldn't get in the door to do inspections, so it was prescribed by law. We, did, we didn't have a choice, and they were like, "Well, that's no excuse." Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I, what? I, I did one or two. How and was that possible? <laughs> baffled. It's like I, I would have rather been out there doing the inspection, but we weren't allowed to. So, but I mean, inspections at least minimum every six months. We do quarterlies, but six month minimum, I think, um, as you need to be in the property building that relationship with the tenant, getting to see what the property is actually like and feeding that back to the landlord to make sure they are comfortable and confident that the property is still in the order that it should be. Yeah, um, so my suggestion if somebody's doing it themselves is probably to take notes, avoid getting, yeah. uh, avoid forgetting anything when you're going round. So if you're doing it this yourself and self-managing, then remember to take notes and avoid, um, uh, to avoid forgetting anything when you're going round. And remember to look up at the ceilings and under the baths and the wash hand basin, the toilets and the kitchen sinks for any sign of leaks. That's a yep. classic. And the radiators as well. Often what we used to joke about was hoover rage, where people used to hoover and used <laughs> yeah. to hit the, you know, the, the, the yeah. pipes as they come up from the radiators. The radiator. And they would, just, they would just put them slightly off angle and then it would start to leak ever so slightly. And over a long period of time, it was causing problems either to the downstairs of the property or to the downstairs property that somebody else has got, or potentially into the floorboards. You would never know anything about it. And the next minute, it's like you take the floor up and you've got rot. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing I would watch out for. Just make sure uh, you check these sort of things as well. What other things can we check for then? Yeah. I think if you're going to self-manage, then you will really need to take the time and keep up to date with the government and uh, lettings industry updates and keep Jeez, it's ever changing, changing by to let legislation and that's yeah. something that you need to do and take time to do if you're going to manage on your own player as you have an agent that's what we do every day um so that is something that's really important keep your safety certificates predominantly gas electric uh, your energy performance make sure they're all up to date and in line with the current legislation um and making sure that you book your inspections that we spoke about in a timely manner Inspections yeah. can be difficult to secure a time and get actually uh, carried out. So make sure you do that well. Uh, well, uh, well Top tip as well for when you're booking the inspections, if you keep getting the tenant turning around to you and saying, oh, I'm not available on that date, I'm not available on that date, or cancelling it last minute every single time, you've got to think to yourself, I think that you've got to think to yourself there is something wrong. It's yeah. like, why are they, why are they continuing to do this? So it is a wee warning sign for you to say that. Um, you might, and I tell you what you can do, you can actually say to the tenant, look, you know, um, by all means, you know, um, if, if you're okay, we, we could actually arrange to just get access. We, we know what we're doing. You trust us. We trust you. So if you're okay with that and you're at your work or something like that, we could just go in and do that because it's yeah. us that's doing it. It's not anybody else that's doing it. Um, so, you know, we're okay with that. They're okay with that. And often in the past, most of my tenants have actually said, yeah, that's fine. It's okay. Uh, is there anything else I need to do when I'm there? Is there anything else you need to tell me about so I can sort it while I'm there? And sometimes it was like, oh, well, this is sorted. And that light switch was cracked um, a wee while ago. And it's like, oh, I could replace that. No bother. And, and at that time, that was fine. I, I had been on a course. I had done all this. I had experience in doing all that and be able to change things as simple as that. Um, so it was easy for me to do that in the past. And then also, you know, there was a there's a wee bit of ambiguity about the top corner. I'm not really sure if that's a leak or where that's coming from, if it's rising damp. And mostly nine times out of ten, it was maybe just the fact that it was just poor ventilation. And the yeah. the condensation was um uh, you know, condensating yeah, in another corner, corner or behind that unit. And that's what that's what was causing the problem because they weren't very sure. So these are all things that uh, um, good inspections and, and a good letting agent can actually make sure everything's okay and above board. Okay, yeah. what else have we got then? Yeah, just uh, to touch on obviously the responsibility of safety certificates. If yeah. they are not put in place um, and, and, and up to date for the date that they're supposed to be renewed, then you're technically you're breaking the law. 
So mm -hmm. I mean, you need to keep that in mind. That is the law. You do need to have those in place. Yeah. Um, confirming your rents paid and keeping on top of tenants when there's any issues with rental payments. Uh, make sure it's paid on time every month and give the tenants a nudge where necessary if they are not keeping up to date okay. or on schedule. So That's... here's my top tip to anybody out there. I know you mentioned that about confirming, giving them a wee nudge. Yeah. Um, so you don't go a confrontation with your tenant if you're self-managing. It's easy to just phone up your tenant or just contact your tenant and say, and you don't say, your rent's no paid. Where is it? Because that's <laughs> confrontational. You just say, look, I don't yeah. think you, I, I don't think you've maybe realised, but this month the rent's no coming to my bank account or it's not been paid. I, I know you've probably just, you know, I, I know it's probably, you don't know about it at all. And a hundred times out of a hundred, you'll get the tenant saying, yeah, oh, I didn't realise, um, I'll, I'll get on to it. Um, now, they probably did realise, but they were just trying to pull a fast one. <laughs> I think as well. Um, um, oh, but it's fine, it's non-confrontational then, and that's not what, you don't want a head-to-head -head confrontation yeah. because then that's when the relationship breaks down and then then obviously it makes it easier for them to do that the next time. And then you've got you've got no choice, but you're backed into a corner, but, but to come out fighting, and you don't want that. And um, so it's all about being non-confrontational when you're yeah. when you're relaying that message to a tenant and maybe the rent's not paid on time or it should be paid yesterday. And it's it, you've got to word it in the right way in order for it to be non-confrontational. So it's not that straightforward. Or you or what will happen is um you'll maybe get a tenant who actually does pay on time every time. You've said it in the wrong way and they say, Well, to hell with you. I'm going yeah. somewhere else. And you think I've just a really good tenant. If it's a tenant who's usually good with rental payments and they do default, touch base with them. I just noticed you've obviously missed payment. Is everything okay? Can I help you? That's the best way to approach it. Yeah. I think as well, also responding quickly to any reports of problems or maintenance issues that a tenant um, has in a property, getting your uh, contractor out quickly as well um, and getting them dealt with in a timely manner is really important. Expected um, repair times, things like that as well. Eh? Yeah. And, and delays in getting the parts. Uh, this is where... This is where we do get a bit of castigated um, from from some tenants, very few though, um, who actually, why is my heating not getting fixed? And it's like, well, the part's got to come from William Wilson. It's a Saturday morning or it's a Sunday afternoon and, and William Wilson isn't open, so we kind of get that part for you. And then we're going to have to, the, the contractor's going to have to inquire on Monday morning and see if that part's in. And if it's no in stock, they're going to have to order it in and it's going to take two or three days. Why is it no, Why is it taking so It's like, but it's going to take two or three days. We can't do anything about that yeah. apart from getting a car and drive away to France to get it delivered. Um, that's it's, So it's no possible. So it's it's from that point of view as well, it's, it's relaying that message across correctly and making sure they understand that that's the reason for the delay. And it's not, it's not the fact that you're not being able to respond quick enough is the fact that you don't have any other choice. Yeah, definitely. You need to relay that message clearly. And I think when you're actively engaged and you're by to let, it shows your tenant that you're taking an interest in them and your property. And it's a really powerful message to send to your tenant. And in our experience, uh, the behaviour is generally reciprocated by the tenant. If you are proactive, they'll be proactive and, and vice versa. It's one of the it's one of the best sayings I ever got from Standard Life. When I remember going to a training with Standard Life when I first started with them in George Street in Edinburgh, and and the the saying I always remember is behaviour breeds behaviour. Yeah, and you get what you put out, and that's uh, that's stuck with me all these years. I mean, that was God, that must have been about thirty, maybe I don't know, maybe about thirty five years ago. I went to work with Standard Life. Uh, in between uh, my um, uh, uh, exams, in between my HND, my diploma, um, and that's that that's stuck with me all these years. Behaviour yeah. breeds behaviour. I mean, I, sometimes I find it a challenge to. <laughs> sometimes I find it a challenge to rein it in, <laughs> but that's one of these things. Anyway, what's your final thoughts on this, Richard? Yeah, I think uh, on the topic damage control, there is so much you could do from the start of the tenancy, managing the tenancy to the end of the tenancy. You need to make sure that you're doing all these measures correctly or have the right person doing it for you. It is. It is experience and track record and knowledge is power in this situation. Yeah. It will save you money in the long run. And if you do it incorrectly, it will lose you money in the long run. And I tell you what, the compounding effects huge about what you could lose. Anyway, that's us for this week. And we'll see you next week for the Five Property Show at Saturday morning, 9.30. Watch out for my update tomorrow and the Wealth Creation Show at 12.30 on Monday. We're going to be talking about 
how to predict your future. Okay, yeah. see you later. Bye-bye, folks. See you later.